The day I circumcised, they said I should open my leg, and I did what they said. My mother told me this is my passage to womanhood. They say if you refuse to lie down, we will force you to lie down. So my dad brings some rope and tight me and hold me very strong. Come away, Kish. Bertram, I'm with Tariq. I'm going to get my hands on I could feel the blade cutting. With every cut, I was struggling. When I was shouting because the pain was too much. I was shouting because the pain was too much. I was shouting because the pain was too I really thought I was going to die. They say it's tradition. Which type of tradition? I had been at The Guardian for 25 years. I was the investigations editor. We were doing really big stories, WikiLeaks, Iraq. I came across FGM and I thought, why if we're doing stories about people having their emails hacked, why aren't we covering the fact that 200 million girls and women are having their genitals hacked off? So we set up the global media campaign and our first backer was the UN Secretary General who launched us in Nairobi. Four years later, a small group of us left The Guardian and set up a charity dedicated to ending FGM, determined to do things differently. I'll hand you over to Maggie. Attends, attends, just, quand est-ce que vous allez partir? There's a huge anger in the activist community fighting FGM because the millions, and there is millions that is being spent on FGM, it's not reaching them. What we do with the Global Media Campaign is reverse that. No to FGM! And a large proportion of our funds go to the grassroots. That's what makes us different. We searched for activists who were working on FGM, who were often survivors, who were already working in the field, and through the volunteers we could see the people who really had the passion. <laughs> what we're doing is we're saying, let's trust that person who's been walking 10 miles a day to go to the remote villages to talk about FGM. They mightn't have a BA, they mightn't have an international development degree, but they are the people who's going to end FGM. Many people respect religious leaders, and I know for sure if religious leaders can stand up with us, this thing will be a history. It's the activists on the ground who go to their religious leaders and say, this is the reality of FGM, and tell people to stop because they'll listen to you. Hurting people, torturing people, it's not right in Islam. Now with the religious leaders talking through media, it's even more powerful. The circumcision of women is not allowed in Islam. The Bible not mention about FGM. The media can be revolutionary and the moment it's here, it's now. When people see, they believe. When they hear, they believe. We have carried out the first ever survey into how media works to change attitudes and the results were extraordinary. For example, in Kenya, our team have been returning to the same region for over three years. They've surveyed hundreds of people and found that support for the worst type of FGM, that means the cutting off of a girl's genitals and the sewing up of her vagina, has fallen drastically. An astonishing 84% of those surveyed now say they've changed their minds about this form of FGM, and that's since our media campaigns began here in 2018. Direct Action Grants are completely organized on WhatsApp. From calling for proposals, to announcing the selected projects, sending the receipts, everything is produced on there. This allows for the campaigns to remain fully transparent, completely fluid, interactive and dynamic at all times. The confidence that GMC has placed on people is inédit. They are motivated. They have confidence, so chapeau. This is a whole new era of community activists who can use the media. Local activists who can set up their own campaigns. Now we continue to fight. They've got the skills, they've got the technology, they've got the heart. They just need to be supported. FGM has to stop. They are the ones who are going to end this, not us. I'm sure if we use the media, we both speak. There will be a massive awareness and change will come. So many children will be saved from this demonic practice because 
I see it as demonic. Now start the discussion. The discussion is going to be in two parts. Uh, our co-founder at the Conduit, Paul Fransale, is firstly going to interview some of the activists who featured in that film, Jeremiah Kipanoi in Kenya, Rigiato Nene in Sierra Leone, Luciane Gando also in Sierra Leone, Ifra Ahmed in Somalia, and Ayobella in Nigeria, and is then going to bring in uh, our, our really esteemed guest, Lise uh, Doucette, who's flown especially from Kiev uh, yesterday to be with us this evening. Uh, so thank you, Lise, for being with us, Dex and Dexter DSQC, and of course Maggie O'Kane, um, who is the instigator of tonight's event and the global media campaign to end FGM. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our brilliant activists and Paul Fensale. So thank you very, very much, Freddie, and uh, it's one of the many, many, many delights uh, about The Conduit is that we have this room of people assembled on a night like this tackling this particular issue. Um, I'm just going to make three quick introductory points. Um, the first thing is we spend a lot of time tackling in our programming core questions of climate and of sustainability, and I think that that's absolutely essential we don't get that right, we don't have a planet that we won't be able to inhabit. But tonight is a night that tells us that we not only want to inhabit a sustainable planet, but we care about the quality of the lives of the people who are on that planet. And that human rights and women's rights are an essential part of what we are fighting for. And if we neglect those or marginalize them or don't pay attention to them, we do so at our peril. And the integrated approach to trying to build a just and better world is an absolutely core part of what we're trying to do here at The Conduit. Um, the second thing is one of our core principles is Ubuntu. Uh, it's appropriately an African philosophy. It means I am because we are. And it is really premised on the idea that our connectedness with each other is what makes us human. And <clears throat> for those reasons, I am really, really, really excited to have this group of remarkable people on the screen behind me because we may be sitting here in Covent Garden, but we are and should be deeply connected to what they're doing and the work that they are trying to fulfill. And this community at The Conduit, uh, whether you're here tonight, whether you're joining us for dinner afterwards, whether you're going to get involved in this campaign, is about enjoining all of us to lead lives where we actually make a difference and we spend the time and the energy and the effort that we have to try and lead to a better and more just and a more sustainable world. And the final thing I'll say is, and I say this as a person who's done a lot of human rights work in my own country in South Africa, is I like the hierarchy of how we're doing tonight and what this campaign is all about because the people we're about to hear from are the frontline heroes on the ground doing the work and who have the credible and authentic voices to win the struggle. And I'm always, with respect, somewhat suspicious of campaigns and efforts that don't put these voices at the front and don't gear themselves to giving agency and activism and support to these voices because these are the voices that stay, that endure, that fight the fight, and that make the difference. Um, so I am incredibly, incredibly privileged to be able to welcome uh, this group of people onto our stage and onto our screens. Um, so I'm going to, and, and it also just from a range of different countries, we are definitely going to have tech glitches. So bear with us. Um, but, uh, but we're going to kick off. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Jeremiah. Um, and I want to ask you 
just about these campaigns that you're involved in. So tell us, do they actually work? How do they work? Do they stop cutting? Um, how many girls have you helped um, protect or whose rights you've helped to enforce through these campaigns? Thanks a lot. I think uh, it's been um, a roller coaster over the years. Um, but I just would like to focus on the most recent one, which is December last year. We have a community, it's called the Kuria community, which is at the Kenya Tanzania border last year. Um, they had a cutting season and it's found next to the Lake Victoria region. Um, of course, in Eastern um, Africa, uh, they had mass female genital mutilation ceremonies. In the Kuria traditions, girls are cut in large numbers and then they are marched home bleeding. Activists uh, from the community raised the alarm and we took to social media. And um, by then it was really quiet. No one really um, noticed that anything was happening there. But we took to social media using the hashtag uh, Stop Kuria FGM Now. And what we did is that we called on to the government to act and to stop the cutting. And uh, despite, of course, being slow as usual, um, we continued to share evidence and called on to national and international stakeholders to put pressure on the actors to stop it. 293 girls were rescued and uh, they were put in temporary rescue shelters by activists on the ground. Unfortunately, up, uh, more than 500 were still cut. And this would have been even worse if we, didn't, uh, if we did not inter intervene. Um, approximately 3,000 girls were cut during uh, COVID last year. And um, this year, from our efforts, 57 parents were arrested, 10 were jailed, and 18 were still being held. Uh, they're still being held, awaiting trial, which is going to be... A, this is just within one small community in the southwest of Kenya. Imagine how it would look like in a country where some communities are having a prevalence of 90, 93%, 86%, 84%, and we are still looking at marginalized area uh, areas as well as underreported cases. So yes, the campaigns work. They do work uh, when they are called out, but for the communities that do not have people to speak out, the girls really don't, don't have the voices. Um, no one really listens to them. So Jeremiah, I wanted to ask, I know that COVID sort of distorted the picture of both the practice and the campaign to how to deal with it. I know that there is a, there is a real fear that uh, in and around Easter, there will be a, re a resumption of this practice. Uh, and that I know that you are gearing up a campaign to try and get ahead of this and stop it. So will you tell us a little bit about why we're concerned about the, uh, what might happen in Easter and, and what you're trying to do uh, in the run-up to that holiday? Post-COVID-19, Easter is the holiday that really is long. At least here in Kenya, when children are home from school, we have about seven weeks. And seven weeks means that there is more time for cutting the girls and enough times for the girls um, to heal the wounds so that the education uh, ministry probably doesn't detect that many girls were cut or underreported uh, or report, uh, reported cases that girls are not reporting back to school. And so this Easter offers a big opportunity um, for those who want to cut their children to do it. And uh, it's also a political season, at least here in Kenya. And so uh, a lot of effort, especially in the, uh, uh, in the security forces, goes to uh, political rallies, as well as um, uh, trying to make sure that the communities do not um, uh, wreak havoc when, during those political seasons. So it's really um, a difficult time. And uh, for, for us, we've just already began uh, looking at what are the ways that we can uh, harness the power of um, activists and just make sure that we speak on one voice and just stop it uh, during this time. So we've already started meeting campaigners and journalists uh, from these hotspot, hotspot areas to ensure that there is enough preparation and coordination so that we are not caught off guard when the cutting begins. 
we already plan on running local and uh, national media campaigns to hold accountable those in power, uh, those those in positions of power, and this could be both government as well as uh, non-profit organisations uh, who've been working in those areas, just to make sure that the interventions that have have been done in those areas really are followed up on, and the real cutting is happening. And um, during, because uh, if if this happens and cutting happens in Easter, uh, we we will just do what we did in December, and that is going to social media and ensure that those who are supposed to do their job actually do their job. And uh, the good thing is that we have a network, a strong network of activists on the ground, and they are always willing to uh, put their lives on the line and um, share those pictures and videos and photographs and evidence that sometimes goes, uh, the stakeholders often deny them. So um, once you share those, it's really undeniable that it's happening. So that's basically our plan for Easter. Fantastic, well, thank you. Ayo, we're going to travel across uh, from east to west uh, to you in Nigeria. And I know you have recently been on a trip to engage with tribal leaders and show them films and materials about FGM. Will you tell us both about that trip and, uh, and the impact that you think it achieved? Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Very well. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I engaged on a trip to um, engage um, traditional rulers in Nigeria. There's a lot of prevalence of cutting of girls, you know, it's a form of violation of girls' rights. And um, I thought of it that what ways, what can we do to end this practice? The first thing is to engage those with high influence to put an end to the practice. And the, the first set of people that came to my mind are the traditional rulers. They have the power to effect change. They have the power to stop people from engaging in cutting because cutting is highly rooted in culture. So I went around, showed videos of cuttings to um, prominent traditional rulers. I also shared my story as a survivor because I was caught at age five. And um, I also shared the implications and some of the personal issues I am dealing with as a result of the cutting with them. Some of them still believe strongly in the cutting, you know, but um, after lots of engagement back and forth, you know, they came to realize that it is a bad practice and they would support our campaign. And that's a very huge um, um, victory for me. But if I want to get... Um, a complete victory. I need to get them on the TV. I need to get them on the radio. We need to make sure that people here, you know, these traditional rulers themselves champion the campaign. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. You know, we have lots of girls that have been through this experience and um, I receive lots of cases daily and it's quite pathetic. So um, especially now that the Easter season is approaching, it's a festive period and Nigerians always take advantage of festive period to perpetrate whatever cultural beliefs they, 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 they have strong convictions about. So I would be glad if we can even engage the traditional rulers before the, the Easter cutting to ensure that, you know, people are not, people are grossly or highly discouraged from perpetrating this act. The pandemic took us back to square one. During the lockdown, people continued cutting. So many girls were living with their abusers. So it skyrocketed, you know, the number of cases. So we are even trying to get back, you know, to, to, to where we were as at 2020. So we need to double our efforts to ensure that, you know, we end this practice. So the voices of the traditional rulers alongside the young campaigners need to be heard. And we need the media to achieve that. So let me ask you the question about the precise role of the media, because I can, just from this brief conversation, I, I suspect that you are forceful and persuasive in your own right. And we have sat here and listened to both an audio file and a video, watched a video uh, in relation to FGM, and it's been, for me personally, you know, moving and, and, and arresting. So what specifically does, do, does the media do to strengthen your campaign and how does it assist the effectiveness of what you're doing? Okay, thank you very much for that question. So I started campaigning against FGM seven years ago 
So at that time, I used to go from houses, door to door, knock on people's doors to say, hi, have you heard about cutting? Do you know it is wrong to cut your girls? And we engage in conversations back and forth. And I would spend hours doing this. I was a student. I was an undergraduate. I was just passionate about creating change. But when I got involved with GMC, with just one hour radio airtime, I can speak to millions of people. I can have people phone in. So the media has a huge impact. The media, we can't underestimate the power of the media you know, in creating this positive change. The media doubles our effect. You know, it has given me lots of success stories. I have people who call me to tell me, Ayo, because of the program you heard last year, my family has decided to stop cutting our girls. You know, so lots of these success stories make me happy because all of these statistics we see about those who have gone through FGM, they are human beings. They are people's daughters, they are people's aunties, people's nieces, mothers, and all of that. And we need to put faces to these statistics for us to bring an end to it. So the media is like the most viable tool we can use to get our messages out there. We can't keep going from house to house. So we need to engage the media. And most importantly, we need to get the right people on the media. We need to encourage the activists. We need to get the channel rulers. We need to get everybody, every influential person, you know, on her. The voices need to be heard. You know, cutting is a behavioral practice. So people need to keep hearing. They need to keep hearing the word. They need to keep hearing for us to, you know, gradually erase that practice because culture is not static so people need to our voices need to be heard consistently if we want to achieve an fgm free world thank you so much io i'm going to pop down to sierra leone and speak to lucianne lucianne are you can you hear me yes i can get you clearly fabulous so can you tell us a little bit about the campaign and the media campaigns that you are running uh, specifically in Sierra Leone and an example of a campaign that you think has uh, prevented cutting and saved lives. Give us some tangible examples, please. Being an aged of Sierra Leone itself was something that was shrouded in secrecy because we took it. So as a young reporter in 2006, I started myself to get something that's all at Lucian, Lucian. People was a poor. Lucian, I suspected this might happen, um, but we're having a, a little bit of a connection difficulty with you. Um, what I might do is pop down and speak to um, Ifra for a bit, and then see if we can get a better connection to you. So hold fire; we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna come back. Um, Ifra, can you hear me? I think you may be on mute. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you, sorry. Hi, Efra. Hi, Hel good evening, Efra. Hello, great to see you. Um, so you've worked uh, inside ID IDP camps in Somalia. Um, and in October last year, there was one camp where seven women and girls died in just two weeks from FGM. Um, the So an 18 year old obstructed and she um, so I think we everybody in this room has a clear sense of the horrors of and the consequences of this um, but I'd like you to just give us some accounts from the ground of what you're confronting and then some yeah. of the campaigns that you yourself are leading and working on to try and both reduce and abolish this practice 
Yeah, I, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, Somalia, you know, is a country where FGM is practiced almost in 98%. And I remember first time when I drank to global medic campaign to Somalia, a journalist was zero uh, understanding of uh, human definition or human rights. But now uh, where we have a thousand of journalists who are themselves uh, activists, the campaigners, and you mentioned about the, uh, the women who have died in IDBs and young girls. Uh, during COVID, it was very difficult for everyone, uh, all of us, for as a activists and campaigners. And I remember uh, becoming a new mother and living in Ireland, where we heard that women in IDBs practicing everything because they see that it was an opportunity because younger were not going to school or Holy Quran because of COVID, they stayed at home. So they were still practicing and cutting. But um, the radio has given us a really platform where people can uh, listen on radio and people can uh, listen the news or even uh, the religious leaders speaking on the radios. Uh, and through that, we find out about these seven girls who has died in the camp and plus young girl who was 18 uh, first to become a first mother she lost her life and then she lost the, uh, the baby's life and uh, uh, how we felt is that through the journalists who been our activists in, in the grassroots um, we went to the community because we believe that the media has a, a bigger voice as I always say that uh, we can't do anymore going to door to door, uh, we need a media. Uh, us as an uh, activist in grassroots in Somalia, we train uh, the people in IDBs, uh, personal displaced. These people, they are not refugees, but people, they are people who flew from war of, uh, you know, farming and different problems to uh, escape for that. And we go to them every time during the 6th of February, during International Human Rights Day, during Women's Day, during 16th Day Activism and African Child's Day. So um, we train them to become a trainers and also educate within the women in IBBs. Uh, through Global Media Campaign, we contribute over 200 radios, those women in this place, to make sure that they listen. Um, if I talk about how important it is to encourage for the journalists and giving them airtime to actually uh, broadcast of uh, broadcast on uh, the um, the activities like uh, somebody died for bleeding or somebody being cut or you know uh, young women uh, bleeding because they don't really understand when somebody is giving birth and they um, you know uh, when they are cut. They are so it badly, and then during the childbirth, they can bleed and reopen, and they are risk also uh, to have a fistula and things like that. But same time, because these women are from rural area, and they believe if they go to hospital, they might take uh, if they have a cesarean, for example, they worry that they are taking out their kidneys or one of the uh, human organ uh, organs. And we encourage them that they, we have to save at least the mother or we have to save the, uh, the child. So we train them to make sure that they are willing to go to the hospital and make sure they are saved. And the reason we give the radio is that uh, to make sure, again, when there is a religious leader speaking on the radio or when the journalists are speaking about female genital mutilation, they listen on the radio and they come to understand that there is an issue that they need to fix. Uh, when I say Somalia is a, a country where FGM is practiced, 98%, it's not easy and it's not uh, you know, uh, easy number to speak out, which means every girl in the country have gone through on female genital mutilation. And again now, um, to talk about Easter, uh, Somalia doesn't celebrate Easter. But uh, this year, April is 30 days of month of April, is a Ramadan, is a time where family are actually um, celebrating of cutting their daughters during this time.
because uh, during the Eid, every every girl celebrates that she was cut and all that. And why important for us to start a campaign for 30 days is that to make sure no more girls to be cut in the IDB camps, to make sure that something we can, every any, every, any of us can make a difference to suffer in Somalia. So uh, I actually want to say thank you, Maggie, because Maggie is a woman who believe the activists, who believe the grassroots, who believe the media is a way to amplify the voices. Because uh, these young girls who have died in the camp, we wouldn't know if the journalists that we trained, they didn't told us. And also, um, I wanted to remind everyone Maybe you have seen or maybe you haven't seen. There was a young girl died in cutting, during her cutting on bleeding in a village called uh, outside uh, Galmuduk. Um, her father was blind and he said that she was her right hand side. And now the father become an activist himself because of the media, because of the power of the journalists and people speaking on the media that he decided himself to be an activist. He had done interview with VOA, BBC, even not because of GMC or IFRA Foundation, but himself as a father who lost his own daughter, he decided that a media is a way of raising his voice, telling his own community that I had my own daughter, she died because of FGM. I wanted to raise my voice and people to know that please don't do what I did. Because the father, uh, when I listened one of his interviews, he said that the ba uh, girl who died on FGM was on his uh, right, hand, uh, right hand because he said that when she was four years old, she started bringing the water, uh, leading him to the toilet or bringing his small things that he needed. And she grew to take the father when he goes after the livestock. And the girl was 13 when, uh, when she died because of FGM. And now the father is actually, he, he become his own activist doing raising awareness in the rural area he's in. And because of the media, that's he, how he understood that this FGM is a harmful and is a, a danger and is a risk. And thanks to our journalists who are living around the country, who shares every day with us what they see, what they hear, and people who contact them. Because I remember first time when I speak on public in Somalia, uh, I could not have a man to interview me on FGM because the man would be shy and shamed to talk about female genital mutilation and women's part. But now, thanks to uh, everybody's work, including Global Media Campaign, training the journalists to become the voice of the human rights, the voice of the um, women's rights and female genital mutilation. We're now a young man going to the uh, rural area of uh, IDB camps. Uh, this person, women, who has her daughter, FGF, and you know, um, media, uh, bringing a program on radio doesn't cost much. $300, a young journalist can go to the rural area of IDB camps to do a program which is 30 Ifra. minutes and 40 minutes. Amazing. And people in IDB can still listen what they have heard on FGM. Um, Sorry, I talked too long. No. I mean, I just can't interrupt that story. It's too powerful. And it's common with people with your passion. So thank you very much for telling us. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, uh, Lucianne, I want to check if we, if we have you again. Can you hear me? Yes, I am. Oh, great. I can hear uh, you clearly. So, I, I, you had the floor, but I was going to ask, you, you had some specific examples of some of the media campaigns that had been working in Sierra Leone, and we'd just really love to hear them. Yes, can you get me clearly? For now, thank goodness. Hello, can you get me clearly? I can. Okay. Um, this FGM is in Sierra Leone, and it's an aged old tradition in the country, which has been practiced for as long as Sierra Leone existed. So it's 
difficult to talk about it before. Nobody dares to talk. Everybody was afraid. And in fact, women are not encouraged to talk in those days. But when I became a journalist, somebody inspired me and she started talking about FGM. But she was afraid to talk because nobody listens to her and people will see her as if she is an abomination to the land because you dare not talk about the tradition. So we started. Since 2006, I started making reports on FGM and started bringing it on the spotlight. But it was difficult because people were frowning against us. So until I met GMC, we went to Ireland. And after that inspiration, when we came back, I decided to work with a group called Forum Against Harmful Practices. I was reporting for them whenever they have their activities on FGM and report. And then I started growing, you know, likeness for the campaigning because I know the devastation of FGM on our women and girls. We have promiscuity in Sierra Leone mainly because of FGM. The men, they are ashamed to talk about it because as for them, it is a tradition. But deep down in their hearts, they know that they are chasing those young girls who are not yet caught because they have problems with the women who are caught. So it's a serious problem, but nobody dares to talk. So GMC helped us to work with UN Women, and we are funded to run a media campaign at Cadley. So I took my colleague journalist, we went into this campaign at Cadley, and our eyes were open due to the kind of videos, the kind of, you know, um, encouragement that we have not to be afraid because it's a human right. It's an issue that has to do with women's survival. So we took up the campaign against FGM. After that particular media campaign, we came out as a firebrand and we started report, reporting on FGM. We made a group, a WhatsApp group. So if anyone has a problem, we communicate swiftly. So we started campaigning. Since we started that campaign, a lot has changed in Sierra Leone. Before, you cannot sit on the radio and talk. You cannot be on TV and talk on FGM. Today, we have opened the space. The media has set it, and there is a space for any discussion on FGM in terms of health, in terms of social implications, in terms of looking at tradition and see what is best for us, the way forward. We have created a big platform in Sierra Leone, and there is a debate now on FGM. And because of the media, we have started seeing, because before we have over 90% of women who are caught. Today, it's gradually reduced it, but we still have the problem because we still have people who hold on to their tradition, and they are preaching that this is our tradition. We met our four mothers. They have gone through it, so we must also go through it. But there is this big debate now because it is now on the media. People can talk about it. You can go to any radio station. You pay for airtime. They will give you the platform. You will talk. People will participate. Phoning programs are being run by us. And anytime we have funding, we go on radio, we go on television, we make our jingles. We pay on TV, we pay on radio, we hear the jingles. So we have sent a message, clear message. And now there is an awareness. And even because of this intervention, sometimes in 2016, there was a serious problem that FGM campaigners had to go together with the help of the police to rescue about 12 underage girls who were set in the shrine to be caught. But they were rescued because of the media. Secondly, we have seen that the media has the potential to bring a change. Because in Sierra Leone, when we had Ebola, People had a myth that this is a lie. The white people want to tell us lies. They are lying. This is not true. We are going to bury our dead bodies. This is our tradition. So it was very difficult for the government by then. They were fighting against Ebola. People were fighting to get Ebola, and they were dying in their numbers. So we, as journalists, we have a journalism fraternity, which we call Sierra Leone Association of Journalists. We came together. We said, look, we are media people. We cannot keep quiet. 
while our people are dying on a daily basis. Let us take the media to them. Let's take the fight against Ebola. So join the fight. And for the fact that sludge came into the fight, Ebola became a thing of the past. Because we will mostly use the media to speak to our people when they see their children from the north. They see us from the south. They see those from the east. They see those from the western area. Talking to them directly in the languages that they understand. They started believing. And that was the time Ebola started reducing. So we conquered Ebola because of the media. There is another testimony about the media. There was this thing called leprosy and this sicknesses, measles and all of those sicknesses. It was difficult to get some to the people to understand about behavioral change. When the media took up the fight robustly, those sicknesses became a thing of the past. So we have those examples to, to, to show, to, to, to let people know that the media has the potential to stop behavioral practices that are not good, that Amazing. are going against the health of human beings. So we believe that if we continue robustly on the media, FGM will become a thing of the past. It's Amazing. just a matter of time. Because now we are targeting the young girls, we are targeting parents, we are going to use different programs, youth programs, we are using women's programs, we are using our own funding to also fund programs. So the way we are going, if we continue to have the support, I believe FGM will become a thing of the past. Because now we have formed a coalition, the media is working with the forum against harmful practices, we are collaborating, we have a very neat collaboration. Whenever they have something, they just call thank us you. and you see it robustly on the media. Lucian, thank you. Yes. Um, I, I definitely have the worst job in the world, which is to come to try and, 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 and move through people with such both personal experiences and passion, so I'm incredibly embarrassed even to have to interrupt you. But um, I wanted to go to Rigiatu, who is, who's been waiting very patiently and is also in Sierra Leone. Um, can, you, can you hear me? I can get you. Thank you so much. Can, You're welcome. Can you hear me? I can get you. Rugiatu. Yes, I can hear you. Hello, hi. Uh, Thank you for, for waiting so patiently. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you a quite specific question, um, and it's really about not just girls, but also um, adult women who um, undergo FGM and the pressures that are brought to bear on them both to undertake the practice but also the work that you've been doing to try and um, both diminish and halt this practice, but also some of the specific campaigns you've been working on, particularly with the use of the media. So um, <coughs> over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, FGM is a tradition, it's a culture, and everyone believes that as a woman you have to go through this. And so, if you are not caught, your peer, peer pressure, mockery, provocation is what actually pushes women, matured women, to give themselves up to be caught. And, you know, when you are in a community, especially in rural communities, everybody in the community as a woman is expected to be caught. You have to go to FGM. And that is why in every village you have the place where you are caught. So, when they, they call the ceremonies and they bring the initiators, if you are not a member, you don't have the sense of belonging. So, in the process of wanting to belong, in the process of wanting to be part of what is happening as a woman in your community, you will decide to say, I want to be caught. And most times, when you are caught, you have the consequences. For instance, in December, a 21-year-old Matsiri gave up herself, even at the disapproval of the father, 
who said they don't have the money to pay because it's expensive. Masire went as far as doing odd jobs to raise money so she can pay for her to be cut. And it is during the process that she died. And it is not just Masire. There was also a six-month-old woman who was caught and then she died because of excessive bleeding. So mockery and provocation and the process of feeling belonging community, elderly women also think they have to go through the procedure. And this is why, as activists, as campaigners, we are working in rural communities. Most of the women in rural community are not educated. They have never been to school. And we have the highest illiteracy rate amongst women in Sierra Leone. And so we believe engaging women in the community, rural community, is a way as helping them to raise their awareness. Masire and our community have never had any information on FGM. She doesn't know that if you are caught, there are consequences. All what she was looking up to is for her to become a member and feel belong and be accepted. Because there are certain gatherings they call in rural community. It's only women who are members, those who have been caught, those who have gone to FGM that are allowed to attend those meetings. So because women want to be past those gatherings, so they give up themselves to be caught. The only thing you have to do is to engage them educates them. And so as activists, that is why we are working in rural communities, working with traditional leaders, working with our religious leaders, so that in the rural communities, they also switch the messages in their religious places. But most time in Sierra Leone, women are pushed into subjecting themselves to go through female genital FGM for a sense of belonging because they want to be accepted in their community. If you are not caught, you are not accepted. If you are not caught, you are looked at as an outcast. And that is why it is necessary to continue engagement in rural communities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up Maggie and Liz and Dexter. Please stay online because we're going to have an audience participation section. And I'm sure that there are going to be people in our audience who are going to want to, to, to talk to you more. But I'm going to bring up, uh, come on up, guys. Please come again. But before, before we did that, I wanted to just pause and, and pay particular tribute to you guys because whether it's in Nigeria or Sierra Leone or Somalia or Kenya, the work that you are doing is making the difference. And this entire campaign is predicated in both giving you voice and giving you the tools to do the remarkable work that you do. So thank you very, very, very much on all our behalves. So, so I, I don't really think you need to say anything because I think you just no, had, not at all. <laughs> you just had the most extraordinary testimonial to the power of this campaign through the voices of people who are doing it. So we could all kind of just you know take off our shoes and and uh, and celebrate this gang. But um, I wanted to start um, maybe turning to you, Lise, for a second, and just uh, you you know your you don't need any persuasion about the, the role of the media to end conflict, promote human rights, fight for the interests of women. Um, but what is it about this particular campaign and this particular issue that has grabbed your attention? And what is it particularly about the power of the media that you think can make really incremental and step change difference in this particular regard? Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you. It's what an honor to be with all of you here tonight. And I think nights like this remind us, I'm sure you're like me, you listen to the radio in the morning and you want to turn the radio off because there's so much, everyone's nodding, so much bad news. And even though we've gathered tonight to try to all work together to end something, which is a, a crime in our time, 
what we're seeing tonight is reminds us of what is good in our times. The fact that the dazzling changes in technology allows us to meet these incredible women in Jeremiah as well. The power of the Zoom, the immersive audio we began with, the fact that all of us were invited here by emails on our telephones, that we have the world in our pocket now and allows us to gather here. And I think, but what they have also reminded us by using this magic of technology, they remind us that we're all a little bit old fashioned too, because what really works is the old face to face human interaction. If you were in front of Lucianne somewhere in the village in Sierra Leone, you'd not be able to get away. When Lucianne and Io say to us, can you hear me? Am I clear? And if we were face to face, can you imagine the power of that kind of interaction? And it's not just that, it's the fact, and each of them have touched on it and the film touched upon it, is that their voices are so loud and clear. But their voices are also amplified by the use of a medium, by technology, that was around long before the internet, the radio, which was the first to shrink the distances between all of us and to connect us even more. And all of us here in this room know about the power of radio. We say in my business, it's so much more intimate. We feel that it speaks to you. And it's not just what we hear on the radio, it's how the message is conveyed. What kind of language, and what we're seeing today is not just about languages, it's the dialects of those particular areas of the people who are listening to the radio. And it's not just the language in which it's spoken and the content of the message, it's who's actually speaking the message. You know, we saw Io going in face-to-face -face meeting the religious leaders in Nigeria. We saw Ifra going in the tent to meet some of the, the villagers that she wanted to speak to. By getting the authoritative voices, that really is what is the power to change. And I know Maggie will remember how she, like me, probably you go out and as an international journalist, you anguish about are your stories going to change? She probably wanted to change British policy in the Balkans when she reported so powerfully then. I worry that will any of the stories that I do have any change? But I, over the years I've become to believe, and I don't know whether you agree, is that change comes individual by individual. It comes house by house people listening or watching. And this is what's happening here. It's the radio in the house, but not just the radio in the house. The fact that after the messages are conveyed, you have Ifra showing up at the door. You have Jeremiah in Kenya going around with his campaign. It's the power of technology matched by the people on the ground who know how to make a difference. It's an absolutely brilliant combination, which I think is why there's still so much to do, and all of us winced when we heard about the cutting season from Jeremiah, when we heard about 98% in Somalia, so much more work to do. But this is where I think the first, the first steps are beginning. I lived in West Africa for five years in the early 80s, and when you heard about FGM, first of all, people had to spell it out because no one knew what FGM meant. Nobody talked about it. This is what we also heard from Lucienne. Nobody talked about it. Nobody did anything about it because you want it to be, it's that belonging that we heard about. And we certainly, rarely, if ever, heard that scream. And I think I speak for everyone here tonight that when you heard that scream, it sent a shiver down your spine. Maggie, I'm going to come to you towards the end. So forgive me as sort of person who's leading this. I'm going to return to you um, because you, you're, you're going to be given the starring role in some ways towards the end. But I wanted to, no, I wanted to, I, yeah, no, no. I, I, but I, but as the sort of, I wanted to do a little bit of a kind of jurisprudential geek out with Dexter for a few yes, seconds. Yes, definitely. Let's um, do and, that. And 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 I, I want to because I think one of the things that's important to do 
is to knock on the head some of the arguments around this practice. And that, that those are culturally charged arguments. They can be religiously charged arguments. And so, like so many other things, culture and religion can permeate into law. Um, so, so tell us, A, about your engagement with this, but tell us why the argument that these aren't age-old, positive, sacred, valuable, culturally relevant African and, and other places, but largely African traditions, that ought to be given a certain degree of both respect uh, and, and protection, perhaps, both in law and, and in culture. What's the... Engage with that for a moment. Yeah, so with slavery. So with slavery. It doesn't mean it's right. The fact that it exists does not mean it's right. So what David Hume said, and this contradiction between is and ought, just because it exists doesn't mean it's right. A couple of points, I think, Paul. First point is there is no distinction between people have talked about women's rights and human rights. There's no they, women's rights are human rights. That's the first thing. Okay. Second thing. I think when I I started looking at this, I was on a sabbatical in the United States, in Boston, and we talked to women from West, principally from West Africa in Cambridge at, at Harvard. We talked to them about their experience of life. We, and we did some t um, just questions and answers. And we asked them about, what do you associate with the United States? And they would say, McDonald's and Donald Trump. We'd ask them what they associated with uh, Britain. And equally stereotypical, they would say it was the royal family and drinking tea. And then, and then we would say to them, what do you associate with sex? And the answer they would come back with is pain, pain. And there was one woman in particular, and she said that when she had sex with her husband, she would faint. Now, that tells you about what it gets, starts to let you access what is happening here. Because it's all very well to say that there's a tradition, there's a cultural practice, there is some kind of spur, I, I'm bound to say, spurious religious justification, which is not actually true. But the question is, why does that happen? What is it? And what it is about, we think, I think, the tentative uh, hypothesis I offer to you, it's about the sexual control of women. It's about controlling women's uh, biology. It's about trying to control their reproductive capacity. And if you think about it as an, as an effective form of trying to deter women from having autonomy about their own sex lives, think about that, that if you have sex, it is so painful that you might faint. Now, that is going to be a very brutal but effective way to stop women from having extramarital sex or sex with somebody other than with their male partner. So that, I think, is starting to get close to what is happening here. This is about the social control of women's sexuality. So that, I think, is what underpins the tradition. It's what underpins the culture. So, you, so once you understand that, you then look at the legal position. The legal position is actually quite interesting, isn't it? Because when I was at Harvard... I was trying to in, change the law in this country. We're trying to strengthen the law about FJ in the United Kingdom. What um, people would say to me is, well, look, Dexter, you're always banging on about the human rights of indigenous groups, the human rights of minority ethnic groups, and yet you are trying to impose, to parachute in Western ideas of what's right and what's wrong. And so you are engaging, this is the argument, Paul, you are engaging in an act in effectively of Western imperialism. What the fallacy and what's wrong with that argument is you must understand where it is that this battle, because this is what it is, what we're trying to do is end FGM. It is a war. 
It is a war to try and protect children. Where did that start from? It didn't start from people like Maggie and myself in the West. It started with women in sub-Saharan Africa, like some of these incredible women we've heard from tonight, who have said, I've been cut, my mother was cut, my grandmother was cut, but I can tell you what, I am not going to let my daughter be cut. And, they, and that is where the movement started, with women who were exercising their agency, exercising their autonomy and saying, we've had enough. And what we try to do is to support and stand by them. We don't speak for them. We do not have that right. And when you hear them, as we've heard them so powerfully and compellingly tonight, you can see they don't need us to speak for them. They do not. What they do need is for us to provide them with logistical support so they can do their incredible work. And what none of them have said, but and I've worked uh, with FGM activists on four continents, my human rights, international human rights work, on four different continents. What none of them have said, probably through modesty and just because of the types of people they are, is that it is incredibly dangerous at times. It isn't easy. You are trying to take on an uh, institution of harmful traditional behavior where the stakes are extremely high. And activists I've worked with, and many of these people who um, we've been amazed by this evening, will have received threats, I am sure. And that doesn't stop them. And so what Maggie and I, and as some of you might know, I'm the chair of GMC. <clears throat> what Maggie and I are trying to do, and it's Maggie's idea, this is Maggie's baby. And all I can try to do is to support her. But what we're trying to do is to further empower these people who are, they're changing lives in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. And uh, it seems to me that everybody, everybody who's in this room can make a contribution to that because there is actually a simple and brutalist equation because the clock is ticking. One of the few tweets that I have ever sent out that actually did go viral was I was just sitting when I, when I was lobbying MPs, both in the Commons and the Lords, to change the law in 2015, which we did actually successfully within a year to strengthen the protective mechanism in this country. But I was sitting there in Parliament and I just thought, hang on, if it's at that stage it was three million girls a year, Additionally, getting cut. What, what does that mean? Does that figure, it doesn't actually mean anything. So I try to break it down. And if you do it on your iPhone and you work on your calculator, you'll see what it is. It means that another girl is cut virtually every 10 to 11 seconds. And so the reality is that this is a fantastic evening. But as we've been talking and listening and we've been trying to absorb the stories. It means that somewhere in the developing world, most likely, but also in this country, also in the United States, where 500,000 girls are at risk of cutting, somewhere every 10 seconds, a girl is cut. So by the time this evening is over, the equivalent of about two or three times this room would have been cut. And so the clock is ticking, and, I, and it, what it means is that with the work GMC are trying to do, if you support them, and in any way, and it's not just financial support, which would be welcome, because that would amplify their reach, but by spreading the word about this, you can slow that clock down. And what we're trying to do is to stop it eventually. I'm actually going to pause and turn to the audience because we have, to, what I want to try and do is give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you and let you ask a couple of questions. I'm sure there will be many. Please. Uh, Alicia's bringing a mic. Here she comes. Five seconds away. Hi, thank you for a tremendous conversation and uh, the panel this evening. 
I couldn't agree more that the role of the media is crucial and raising awareness in remote communities, that is absolutely essential. However, one of the points that I would like to focus on is what our friend, um, I can see Galaxy there, what's her name? Okay, so she raised that very important point about a sense of belonging. And so that is very difficult to break. In Sierra Leone, in specific, there are sororities which perform FGM. And these sororities are in alliance or even in partnership with the government because in exchange, they get positions of power. So how can this reality change? Rugiatu, did you get the question? The power of sororities that work in in alliance with or through the government and what can be done to break their power, particularly their involvement in FGM? Hello? Can you hear us? Hello? Can, Rugiatu, can you hear us? Uh, hello? Hello? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? Please. Please, the question again. So, so a member of the audience asked, um, particularly in Sierra Leone, there are sororities that work both on their own but also in collaboration with the government that are involved in and derive support for FGM. And one of the things that what the, the, the audience member wanted to ask was how you can um, diminish their power or or, or, or reduce their impact? Um, in Sierra Leone, we do not have a law banning FGM, neither for children nor for women. As campaigners, what we are asking for is to make sure as a country we have a working document we call a national strategy, and maybe let me give you this good news we have from the government of Sierra Leone today as campaigners. Today, we handed over a letter, a petition letter, signed by 130 organizations all over the world that we handed over to the Speaker of the Parliament, the Honorable Dr. Abbas Bundu. And in its response, he was very positive to say, as a country, we need to join the rest of the world. We need to stand up and make laws to protect our women and girls. We need to look at the culture and take what is good and remove what is bad. And so, as a country, the women have, we are we call, it's a bundle, uh, it's difficult for you to understand, and it is within that bundle that you have FGM. So the law here is going to say, let's remove FGM. Let's maintain the society where women can meet. So we are working with our um, legislative arm of government. We have been able to succeed to make sure there is a committee, an anti-FGM committee in parliament. But that is not enough. Working with rural communities is key. And all that we do, what do we want to achieve is a change of attitude towards how people look at culture and tradition and respect human rights. And that is why we say the media, we, we work together with anti-FGM activists to propagate the message to rural communities. And us walk into those communities where radio cannot reach, so use the traditional media way of communicating. If you go through, for people who are educated and living in big towns, they can go through WhatsApp, they read what is happening. But for those who don't have access, you go and you meet them. And what we are doing is to make sure we push our government to be part of the global world and make a decision to ban FGM in our community in a county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question? In the back over there. Thank you.
Thank you so much for your work and for such a, an, a moving presentation. Maggie, I would think it might be really helpful to hear which countries you're currently working in, which you plan to expand to, and how much money you need to do so. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I just want to say one thing first. I, I, actually, in a way, I don't really need to say anything because actually looking here on this screen, I have the privilege of working with these people. We have the privilege. There's Kaz, there's Dee, there's Mano, there's Alice. We are the GMC team that have the privilege of working every day with people like this. So you can imagine the excitement and the energy we have to be able to serve. And actually, ultimately, that's what we do. We're here to provide, to support the infrastructure. And it's an it's a incredible honor to do that. So in the business of serving, I would say, we are, we are currently working in 10 countries, but you know, just at Christmas, Rugiatu and Lucianne led the way from Sierra Leone into Liberia. They just said, yes, we're going across border. They, took a, well, they went across border and they set up a, a campaign team there. There is now 40 activists in, in Liberia who are ready to, to start going. Um, we also, in May, where's Alice? There's Alice. Uh, we're going into Chad, and I just wanted to say a, a small story about Chad. We, 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 we met a woman um, who was, gave birth to her daughter 12 years ago, who is from Chad, and she, her daughter died 12 years later. There was brain damage at birth. So for 12 years, she lived with her daughter waiting for her, her, her death. And when Alice spoke to her, because she only speaks French and my French isn't good, she said to Alice that GMC might be the light we're waiting to come into Chad to be able to spread the word. And she is you know, ready for, for, for us to move into Chad because there is a whole network of activists there and Chad is, is, is dodgy, difficult. We have to find a way to do it right. So we are ready to go at the speed with which women like Regatu, Jeremiah, Io are ready to go, and you know the speed they can go at. I mean, the only thing that's stopping them is the resource to do it, um, because you have to buy airtime. That's what people don't realize. If you want to get on, on, on air in Nigeria, then you have to buy airtime. If you want a 30-minute radio show in Somalia, as Ifra, Ifra will say, it costs $300. But for $300, hundreds of thousands of people can hear Ifra talking about the girls who are dying from fistula, the girls who are dying from hemorrhaging. So that is the only thing that's stopping them. They will go, they will go, and we will go with them. So... Is that the answer to the question? <laughs> That's all there is to say. I think what's so powerful about what you've said and the way this campaign is structured and what we've, what we've just heard here tonight is it's sort of, there's a whole line of conversation that I was almost prepared to have about this practice, its validity, um, its value, you know, the arguments, the tired old arguments that get trotted out. The ultimate rejoinder to that argument are these voices. It just ends, it just stops it. You just say, here's the victims, here are the voices on the ground saying what an abomination it is, and here's how smart and effective they are in bringing it to an end. And for every year that you delay the practice, less and less informed women are prepared to tolerate it. And the more you stop it and the less women are cut, the less they inflict it upon their daughters or participate in it. And it's simple in some ways. You just empower these people, and it works. <laughs> and, and so it's such a, sometimes human rights work is difficult and complicated and messy, and this is difficult and complicated and messy, but it also has a kind of beautiful simplicity and purity to it, which I think is just evidence in the way that this campaign has been structured. Um, other people, other questions, please. large international NGOs and I just wonder do you work with the large NGOs do they support you or you know is there any collaboration we do work with with large NGOs and uh but I, I'm going to be really honest, I'm not going to talk about who they are. But the way it works in Africa is if you've got a job with an international NGO, then you're part of the elite. That's one. Uh, you probably have cut your own daughter and you're probably a man. So if you want to get this done fast, that's not the conduit 
way to go. Uh, and I think we've all seen that in terms of the sense of urgency. And I'm not saying that some NGOs don't do fantastic work. What I'm saying is these people do it better and they do it faster. Um, yeah, can I just follow up on that? Um, you know, you're doing a fantastic job and the media is absolutely the right way to do it. And getting, you know, these amazing activists out to the sort of religious leaders, the chiefs, etc. But what sort of engagement do you think we need to take with the governments? I mean, you know, we've talked about legislation, and of course legislation alone won't change it, it's attitudes that change it, but do you think that that is actually what needs to happen now, where the governments of each, all, all these countries takes ownership of this problem and starts changing the culture, the tradition, you know, challenging it from within as a government? Um, what, what's your experience of that? Well, I mean, there's a good example of that at the moment is in, in Guinea, where we're working with the, the foreign minister who was actually active in the campaign and is now in the foreign ministry. I mean, there is a lot of money out there, particularly in the World Bank. The way they do it is they go through governments. So every country we go into, we have to find out who is the woman minister to, to approach, who is the minister like we have in, in Guinea, and, and go in that way as well. It's not, the two aren't mutually exclusive. We have to do both. But sometimes, I mean, we're going to Burkina Faso, there's just been a coup. We're in Mali, there's just been a coup. We can't wait for the coups to stop, to end FGM. So that's why we have to go on two levels. I think we have time for one more question. Um, hi, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm training to be a doctor at the moment and hoping to specialise in obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, and I looked after a woman last week who was delivering a baby and had herself gone through FGM. And I saw the, the trauma and the pain that that um, added to her experience. And I wondered if you have any advice for how we can better protect women in this country, the thousands of women and girls who are, um, have either experienced FGM or are at risk here as well. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're trying, we're trying, because, as you probably know, we had legislation in this country, 1985, Female Gen uh, Mutilation, Genital Mutilation Act, nothing happened, nothing happened. There wasn't a single prosecution until about eight years ago, we started really pressing the Crown Prosecution Service and the government, saying, you've got to take this seriously. So we created uh, the impetus, working with survivor groups, also with activists embedded in communities, to force the government to have um, a, a parliamentary inquiry. As a result of the inquiry, we wrote a report uh, looking at their abysmal compliance with their international human rights obligations. We strengthen the law. But you can't prosecute FGM into non-existence. It's not going to happen. What you've got to do, and, it, and it's the question that our friend here asked is absolutely the right question, because the human condition is basically a coin with, with two sides. What um, our colleague spoke about, about belonging, is one side of the coin. And there is, human beings have evolved as deeply, intricately social animals. At Harvard, they say they're the most social animals apart from termites. That's the idea. They're incredibly complex social animals. And so belonging is incredibly important. You police belonging, and this was what we did when we researched um, FGM for the parliamentary inquiry. Well, the question we asked is, why is it in this country, why is it in this country, migrant communities um, from practicing communities uh, send their daughters to be cut in the cutting season, sometimes to countries of origin. The, the most common answer we got to that is fear. It's fear of ostracism, fear of being shut out, fear of being blackballed. So the approach in this country is exactly the same as the approach in sub-Saharan Africa. And what the, the approach has got to be, and this is why I'm a lawyer, I like evidence, this is why GMC has got independently verified data to show that their approach actually does work and significantly reduces the um, intentions of people by about 70, 80 percent more to cut their daughters and their children. So the approach is collective abandonment. 
That's the approach. So if you think about game theory, people do not want to move first. Because if you say, right, I'm not going to do it, it puts you at great risk. It might mean that your daughter cannot be married. That has huge social consequences. So what uh, Lise was saying is right. It's approaching this a village at a time. It's approaching it a region at a time. And that's why the media campaign, if you can focus it and target it, as GMC has done in a particular part of Kenya, you can have a massive effect because everybody is buying into it. So there is that collective abandonment. Once you have that collective abandonment in that region, girls are going to be much better protected. And you need to do that here with communities who are practicing communities, but you also need exactly the same strategy in other countries we're working. Same thing. So Maggie, I know we, we're going to give you the last word. There's a video that you're going to show us. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but before we do so, I'm going to ask Freddie to turn the screen and I'm going to get all of you guys. This is the audience that has been listening to you. So uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Um, Maggie. Uh, they've gone. <laughs> uh, I've said what I've said. It's a great honor to have workmates like those people and the GMC team. And now we're going to be very practical because we're not going to talk village by village. We're going to talk radio, radio station. Um, I just want to give you an idea of what it costs to get airtime. So for £40, you can have 30 seconds of local radio in Somalia, where, where IFRA is working. Uh, £100 in, in Kenya can reach 15,000 people. Um, you can all read. Basically, there's a QR code which will take you through to the website, which will tell you what it costs to actually buy the airtime. And the thing is, we're coming up to Easter. Hundreds of thousands of girls are at risk uh, for, from the Easter cutting. So we would like you all to get involved for this Easter, for next Easter, and maybe up to 2030, when we believe you can eradicate this if we really support the over a thousand activists who are out there and many, many more who are ready to join. So that's the first ask. Um, and the QR code is, is here, but we've also put it upstairs where we're going for a drink if anybody wants to take a leaflet and take a look at it uh, after that. Um, and then this, the second thing we want to ask you to do uh, is to, it's a change of scene. Uh, the change of scene, a change of mood. Uh, we believe that actually FGM has to be everybody's business and we have to reach men. And the way to reach men is through football. So what we're going to do is we're going to run the biggest social media media campaign you can imagine up to the World Cup in November 2020. We've been talking to football players like Effie Ambrose, like, I don't know their names, Roy Keane. I'm going to talk to Roy Keane. Um, Drogba, that's another one, Mano. So, so Mano... <laughs> Mano, who's working with me, has managed to persuade the first four of those football players to, to join. But even this week, we have others who are joining up. So we are going to have at the World Cup and the build-up to the World Cup a massive campaign. So we're going to ask you to get involved in loads of ways in the social media campaign. We're going to be sending out an email afterwards about how you can actually support this campaign. We've got seed funding from UNICEF and the UNFPA to really get it off the ground, and we think it can be absolutely huge. So that's our second ask. So you've got the QR code, you've got the football campaign, and please, thank you for meeting everybody, for supporting us, and we can do this by 2030. So let's have a drink and celebrate. Thank you. My name is Efe Ambrose. These are my daughters, Emanuela and Angela Ambrose. They are both perfect. We say no, no to, to FGM. FGM.